Hi everyone, welcome to another session of Dial M for Films. Writer-director Ruchi Narayan began her journey in films as an assistant director to filmmaker Sudhir Mishra. She grew up in Dubai, Muscat, went to a boarding school in Missouri, and eventually came to Mumbai to study history at St. Xavier's College. After Xavier, she took a one-year course in mass media at Safiya College as a formality, so she could complete 16 years of education that is mandatory to apply for studies in the U.S. Sham Benegal's uncle screened as part of this course. Ruchi came, Ruchi saw, and Ruchi was conquered. In her own words, she says she knew everything she did not want to do until she discovered that films were an option. She co-wrote the screenplays of Calcutta Mail and Hazaram Khwaisha Essi in 2003 and directed her first film, Kal Yesterday and Tomorrow, in 2005. Since then, she has written and directed television shows, advertisements, web series, films for streaming platforms, shorts, documentaries, and music videos. She came back to films earlier this year with Guilty that world premiered on Netflix and during the pandemic delivered her first web series, 100 for Disney Hotstar. Ruchi, welcome to Dial M for Films. Thank you for making the time. Hi, thank you for having me. It's uh, lovely. I, I love this uh, series that you're doing and I'm looking forward to interacting with all of you guys. You know, before we move to talking and writing, uh, uh, talking about writing and directing for films for theater versus films and series for streaming platforms or digital, at, as, it, as it is popularly known, I want to dial back to where you began. You know, Sham Benegal's Ankur inspired you because it made you discover that cinema is not a medium to just entertain, but can also be a vehicle for ideology. You were a complete outsider with no movie-going culture where you grew up, with zero connections in the industry. How did you land the job of first AD with Sudhir Mishra straight out of college and was working with him a conscious choice? Um, well, as you said, Smriti, I, where I grew up, we never went to the cinema. So we never, I mean, it never occurred. We watched movies, but they were movies and it never really crossed my mind that someone is making them. Uh, movies were as much as actors and unlike Bombay, where everyone's so aware of films and everything that goes into it, we had no clue. And uh, when I saw Ankur and you know that last shot where the kid picks up the stone, it really hit me. I think the stone hit me. <laughs> mm. um, and it just, uh, like I was a history student. So I, you know, I, I care about things in that sense. Uh, so it, it then occurred to me that movies can be more than just entertainment. And, uh, you know, at, as a filmmaker, you can share your thoughts, feelings, ideas, experiences. And um, I, till then I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew what I didn't want to do. Uh, and that list was ever growing. Um, and then I thought, oh, this is quite a cool thing. But films was so far away from anything or anyone that I knew that I thought maybe I won't be able to get into films immediately. And it was a very different time. It was like 20, 25 years ago. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe I can do documentaries because, you know, I'm a history student. So it's maybe a more natural kind of progression. Um, and ironically, uh, because I wanted to do documentaries then, uh, my head of department for this course, SCM, the whole year she spoke about um, documentaries and no one wants to do documentaries. So when at the end they were placing us, I said, I want to do documentaries. She said, you can't do documentaries. There's nobody right now making any. So I was like, that's nonsense. I've just been for the film festival and I have a list of documentary filmmakers. And she's like, no, no, I can't place you. You have to do advertising. And I was just like, I am not doing advertising. So I cold called. I found the number of the IDPA, that's the Indian Documentary Producers Association. And I cold called them. And I think, this is my understanding. I think because I had an accent, the guy who picked up the phone 
thought, oh, ye koi hoge. So he has connected me straight to Aruna Rajay, who is the president or, you know, she was like Aruna Rajay, right? <laughs> and she is like the nicest lady ever because she entertained my phone call. And I said, you know, I'm a student and I want to assist someone like an intern. I don't want to be paid. And she actually on the phone gave me a list of phone numbers and said, tell them I have sent you. I mean, who does that to a random person? You know, it was just amazing. Um, so because I had this list with me, I made all these calls. And at, it did turn out no one was, uh, you know, making a documentary at the time. And then I got, I phoned, the last person on my list was a lady called Gopi Desai, um, whose film I had seen. And I called her office and this guy picks up the phone. And I said, you know, I want to speak to Gopi. And he said, oh, she's out of town for three months. So I said, oh, shit. So he goes, why? What happened? So I tell him this soft story that if I don't get a job on my own, then I have to do advertising and blah, blah, blah. So he listens to my whole thing and he goes, is that Ruchi Narayan? And I'm like, who the hell knows me? And it turned out to be Nikhil Advani, who was in Xavier's. So he kind of knew me and his wife had done the same course so he kind of knew knew who i was and he said i'm working with a filmmaker called sudhir mishra have you heard of him so i'm like no what's he done <laughs> so he said he's made a film called dharavi and my reaction is oh that sounds good uh, so he said do you want to meet him and i'm like yeah so i went with nikhil to meet sudhir uh, Renu Saluja opened the door, though I didn't know who Sudhir Mishra was, I knew who Renu Saluja was because I had read her name on like hordes of films, you know, which I had liked. Uh, so I was actually starstruck because I saw Renu Saluja eating an orange. <laughs> and that's how I met uh, Sudhir. And of course, he took one look at me, girl, and said, will you do costumes? So I like, <laughs> what is this Lakshmi Chan story you're telling? Yeah, what to tell everyone here? <laughs> so I just said that you know I have never done costumes, but I'm sure it won't take me more than three days to figure it out. So he just grunted, and I left. And Nikhil said, "So do you want to work with him?" I said, "Yeah, but will he take me?" So Nikhil said, "If I tell him, he'll take you," and he was right. <laughs> And then how did you, you, you were the first AD on, you weren't just doing yeah. costumes, you no, were no, the first no. AD on Isvat Ki Fudane. Yeah, so basically what happened is uh, we started working and I started working in Isvat Ki Subhanehi as a, and I told Nikhil uh, that, listen, I want to be an assistant director. So he said, you do that. And he was the chief AD in those days, it was called chief AD. So he said, you do that and you also be the AD. So I said, okay, I was the junior most. Uh, so I did both the costumes, like I helped the costume person and I did the ADing. And uh, when we got on, like I was giving the clap, I didn't know how to give the clap. I learned on the job and everything. And by the end of it, uh, if anyone knows Sudhir, uh, he is quite volatile. So every AD, there were six ADs, everyone was fired uh, one by one. And the only two who remained from the beginning to the end was Nikhil and me. And um, at, by the time the post came around, uh, you know, there was, uh, Nikhil was busy with Sudhir on something else. So I just got to do the entire post. Like I did the post, nobody else was there. And uh, Renu, I mean, loved me because I was this sincere, eager beaver. And I used to, like, I actually fought to be able to go to the edit. And all I did was sit behind her and watch her edit. And, um, you know, the mm. producers that time weren't letting me go because it's like one more mouth to feed. 
um so you know we fought and fought and finally i was allowed to go to the edit and everyone ended up thinking i was renu's assistant and then she, i did the whole sound the sound design by the end of it i even recorded sound or i used to go and record sound on the nagra uh, i used to do the dubbing of all the actors nobody else was there and uh, renu was like a force of nature so she used to go for the mix the directors didn't really go for the mix uh, so she used to take me with her for the mix and it was a big privilege uh, so i really i mean i actually i learned though i was sudhir's assistant i learned all my craft from renu saluja and she was a very generous teacher like she would never say no to if you asked her a question instead of saying yes and no she would explain she would show you what you were suggesting so that she didn't need to say it won't work you could then see for yourself why it wouldn't work and i mean one thing that i really held on to from renu is because she was so generous that i just feel that uh you know like you know a series like this it's it's imperative to always give back because someone gave me that knowledge as well so it's very important to share it but what incredible people to learn from ruchi in your first uh, you know just in your first job uh, and that also a job that you got interested in because you did a compulsory course <laughs> like you know or it might not have happened i don't know so i i i wanted to move from there and uh, you know when we were talking you said that you got deeply interested you did get a front row seat to every aspect of filmmaking while you were assisting sudhir and of course learning from reno and learning the ropes but the one thing that you got really interested in was uh, the writing you know you wanted to figure out as to how an idea turns into a story and how a story turns into a screenplay um but it's just that there was no job available on set that said assistant writer right so you decided to how did you how did the journey to learn a uh, screen writing begin so basically when i worked on israat like i literally like i said there were two of us working so i worked in every department like i used to go for the grading also um so after finishing that whole process i realized that i understand everything about filmmaking except writing that i just couldn't fathom how do these guys get these scenes and you know how does this, the tracks evolve I, i had no idea so i remember at the end renu actually said now you come and assist me Uh, and i said no i don't want to and i was very uh, brash actually in those days i'm a very nice girl now um she said uh, she said but you know people graduate in editing from fdii and they still wait to assist me and i'm offering you a job so i have told renu but i have understood editing i think i can do editing what i don't understand oh, is editing <laughs> I said I don't know writing, and I want to learn writing. So she said, you know, why don't you uh, talk to Sudhir? Because uh, I think Saurav is going to start working with him on a script. Saurav Shukla. Wow. So I actually went, and I instead of asking Sudhir, I asked mm-hmm. Saurav Shukla. And you know, these guys they were not a very tech savvy, and. Te- by tech savvy i mean they couldn't use a computer in those days so uh, so i just went to saurav and i said saurav you know i believe you're going to start writing a script so he's like yeah i said do you want me who's going to type it out for you so he said i don't know i said you know he said i'm going to get a software i said no no forget the software i will type your script i'm the software <laughs> so he was like why I said no I mean I just want to see how you do it and you know if you if I'm there and I can write it out for you and so he was like yeah sure so I actually typed out an entire script for Saurav which he was writing for Sudhir and that took at least 4 or 5 months 
but in that process what happened is because i was the one typing sora would keep talking to me about the story not that i had even one iota of contribution to it ha huh? i was literally like a sponge i was just taking it in and i think i was being a bouncing ball for sora's thought process but in that i got to see what he's thinking and how he's converting it into a scene so um so really that's how i understood the translation of a story character's idea into into a screenplay and saurav is a very good dialogue writer also so he'd always you know pepper it with great lines and stuff which i was typing so um so that's actually how i learned and as soon as we finished that like he paid me some i don't know 25000 bucks or whatever and with that money i bought my first laptop oh. and uh, i wrote then straight away i wrote of my own accord um there was a book uh, which called the trial of bhagat singh and it was something which moved me a lot so i wrote a mini series on the trial of based on that book no rights nothing i didn't have anything and of course it never got made but because i wrote it and i showed it to sudhir he was like oh this is quite good and you know we he tried to get it made several times but in those days i mean there was no such concept of a mini series and of course now looking at it in retrospect i think i was always attuned to a series format you uh, were on to something yeah <laughs> <laughs> because i was like you can't put this in a film it, it requires you know a, a a longer kind of telling so uh, so yeah so that's how i started and then because that didn't happen while i was doing it sudhir was uh, he was starting the script of hazaron khwaishe and once again I, of course in today's day and age you can't actually say these things but in those days it was a different time so he said um he said uh, you know the character there was a character of geeta and him and shiv subramanyam were talking about writing a film about that time and they were like oh you know but how do we crack this woman's character so they were like just very loosely acha isko le lo she will be able to write the woman <laughs> i uh, you know i have to applaud sudhir for that uh, i am also not going to take names but there are couple of series and material that has come out that makes me actually want to say that if they just took women into the writers room probably they would get to know a little more about the inner world of women than we can see on screen so well done sudhir yeah and also at that so all the, there were everything used to happen at the same time because in those days you have to understand there was no money because there was nowhere for these things to go right so um, so we started working on hazaro with nothing like with no clue like he was applying for a french fund and then it should go to uh, festivals we never thought it would ever uh, release in india and no, no indian would ever see this film um so at the same time sahara uh, was launching a channel and they approached sudhir to do a show like a tv show and he asked all of us like sudhir always had a lot of uh, you know like people uh, in the office so he asked a whole bunch of us to, to pitch some ideas so i also pitched one idea and uh, eventually they Uh, sahara picked my my idea and it was a show called talash so then i ended up writing that uh, along with some others and then eventually i was writing all the episodes or whatever um alongside hazaro because on hazaro there was no money because we didn't know what was ever going to happen with it um so yeah so basically that is where the a writing journey began i must here also mention because i want to give you an idea of 
how many things we all put into motion at in those days because you didn't know what would materialize so at the same time i also had met uh, uh through a, another friend of mine i had met zoya and reema and we had really hit it off in the first meeting and the second time i met uh, zoya she said let's start a company together so we actually started a company called rizla films if you please um uh, <laughs> and we started writing scripts like we would meet in the morning and just write stuff with a view that oh let's just write something and sell it i mean we didn't really have any concrete plan because there was there was no finishing line like there was just no end in sight ke what will ever happen with this it's a journey you would take yeah, yeah. one i mean now you know if you're writing something you can pitch it to this one or you can go to a platform or you know there are these producers but at least for me uh, in those days everyone was so far away they were conceptual you know <laughs> so i'm um, using that line everything everyone was so far away they were conceptual So yeah so that's how so we I started writing here then I met a uh, Sunil Sippy through uh, someone and he said will you write something so there were like three four things which I was writing at the same time and uh, eventually the Talash project happened and I actually got paid for it so um that's how my journey in writing began and that's how I became a legitimate writer my first project was talash which uh, you know then i wrote daily soaps for television i i did all kinds of stuff huh so uh, yeah so ruchi uh, you know you got a lot of i mean uh, you got uh, and deservedly so a lot of attention for hazaro khwaish and uh, you then went on to direct your first film which is kal yesterday and tomorrow but the reason you couldn't make your second film was because of producer issues and also casting issues um it was a deeply disappointing time for you and uh, you know um you decided to move to advertising at that point of time because you were very uh, convinced that there are certain kind of stories that you wanted to tell and you know you're not going to do this uh, if those are stories that you can't tell at this point but it was also a time where uh, you know the seed for guilty was planted in your head because um, there were reasons of patriarchy and misogyny that you thought were also responsible for you not getting your second film off the ground do you want to talk a little bit about that time yeah so firstly i want to say that you know when i uh, did hazaro i had already become a director uh because by then i had not only written talash i had become the director of talash and i had directed some 56 episodes and exactly. so, yeah technically i was ready to make my next film and uh, where i had also edited hazaro khwaish so after the edit the film lay in the cans for 3 years because i mean i think the producers also they didn't know what to do with it and they were just like what is this <laughs> like what are we supposed to do with this film um so it was a very uh, shocking time for me um and also during the making of hazaro i was extremely idealistic because i really didn't understand and i honestly didn't care to understand how the industry worked and how the business worked so i was a very like very puritan in that way um so when uh, i wrote kal uh, in fact they those producers approached me and said we'll produce it for you and i was just like no <laughs> like <laughs> you know i on the poster that you just saw of hazaro khwaish i was like this is what you're going to do to my <laughs> what you to do it <laughs> so i i actually then raised the money for my film like i wrote a business plan <laughs> and i you know i got money from like 14 different individuals and blah 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 so i did all of that and uh, then 
we put out this film through Sony Pictures, and you know, there I had a very strange experience, uh, which relates also to this. I don't know if it's just the patriarchy or whether it's just that I was very brash and I just didn't understand how how things work. And I had this massive fight with the <laughs> head of Sony Pictures. <laughs> so anyway, so oh, long okay. story short, uh, <laughs> by the end of it, uh, by the end of it, after Hazaro and Kal, I had no money. And uh, I also didn't want to do films. It's not like I didn't get other offers to do other things. But I didn't want to do those things. Yeah, even uh, Karan offered you, Karan wanted you to be an associate. Uh, yeah. so and you, you chose, yeah. you opted out of that. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, you know, the, like, you know how I got into films. I have a certain sensibility and I and I come from a certain place where I've really chosen films and I've chosen films for a reason that kind of drives me from inside so uh, like Karan had after uh, Isra Isra he'd heard about me you know that whatever so he called me and he wanted me to be the associate on Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. So this is, that's how old I am. Basically. Don't be, don't be modest, Ruchi, because I think, I think everyone, uh, everyone needs to uh, know. I mean, yeah. I, I think um, we, in Vikramaditya Motwane's session, we will talk about this in detail, which is on next Sunday. But I think um, whichever job that you take up and the, if there is a reputation that you can actually build, uh, and people get to know that you're good at your job within the industry. It's not your regular fame. You're not going to be spoken about in newspapers, but at least in the industry circuits, if people get to know that you're doing a good job, which is what happened with, Shru, uh, with, with Ruchi, that Ruchi did such a good job that, you know, your reputation carries and that's how the path also starts to get made for you. So that's how when Karan heard about you, that's, that's when he offered you Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. Yeah. And the, so, and that was around the time when I was thinking, I want to learn how to write. So when he called me, my first question to him, and he said, "You will you be the associate director? Because I don't know about the technique and all that. I just know how to uh, tell my story. I want to tell my story and I know how to work with actors and you can do everything else. So my only question to him was, have you written the script? thinking that if he hadn't written the script, I would work on it. Got but it. he said yes. So I said no. And <laughs> later, years later, he was like, you know, when you asked me, I felt so ashamed that I said yes, though I hadn't written the script. <laughs> no, but how lovely because he's the one who's produced your film. Yeah. So I think mean, that is... Uh, is actually uh, Karan's greatness also that and he always said that you are the first person who said no to me and he used to for many years introduce me also to people like that she is the first person who rejected me so um, but when I called him so so basically after Karl I got into advertising and you know it was a good way for me to uh, earn money and also work on different short projects and hone my skill and all that kind of stuff. And basically, it's not that I ever stopped trying to make a film. I had already written a film and that film, it was like a road trip film. So when I finished that, I went to, I went to Karan to produce it. And uh, he, he told me, you know, I'm not going to make you run around. If I don't like it, I'll just say, I said, fine. But he did like it. So he said, okay, I'm going to produce this for you. Now, this is while I'm in the advertising thing. So this is how long it's taken me to do everything. Um, so we started trying to mount that project. And I mean, Karan wasn't the first person I went to. I went to some others before. Um, so finally, when I went to Karan, he said yes. And because it was a, it was a love story, we needed a male lead and 
every and everyone wants to work with Karan Johar. We all know that, right? As a, so, but everyone we went to loved the script, but said no to the project. So finally, one day, Karan told me. He said, "You know, I'm. I really hate to say this, but all these boys have loved the script, huh?" But afterwards, they keep hemming and hawing, and they keep asking me, you know, about the director, this, that. And he said, at that time, out of all the people who were in Dharma, the directors, I actually had the most experience. I had won film fair. I had won awards. I I had like a a growing body of advertising directorial work as well. I had made a film, so he was like. you have the most you're the most qualified person right now in dharma and uh, i think they don't want to work with you because you're a woman so i just said well you know i love this film but not enough to have a sex change so uh, there's nothing i can do about this so he he was like don't lose heart and he was you know like giving me a pep talk but i would so angry inside i can't tell you so after i mean i i i let it brew even for a month i went about the usual and then i went i called him i said i need to meet you and i said i want to take this film off the table he's like what do you mean you can i said no i said i'm so angry right now i don't want to work with any of these beep beeps uh <laughs> I said, in fact, I want to write another film which is about misogyny. <laughs> At so, least a theme came out of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so he was like, and of course, now this is not only because it's everything I was doing had kind of led up to like all my battles that I had been fighting. kind of this was the last straw for me you know um the thing is i really am a fighter so i managed to get this far but even in advertising and in the films that i had been working on till then it was a constant battle for me right um so finally uh, i said no i'm going to write this film and i'm coming back so he was he was trying to be nice to me and say no no don't give up but i was on you know fire and i then went to him and i said i'm i want to write a film about rape and because rape is like the the ultimate manifestation of feudalism uh, you know and all this so he at that point and now this is how long ago that was uh, he said but you know nobody in this country ever talks about rape and uh, uh the the damini was made on it in the 80 so it's a little dated i said no it is going to be the biggest issue uh, and he's like how do you know i said because i am a woman i live here i can feel it you can. Uh, and he's like why do you say that i said because we our generation of women have been brought up to think believe and act as if we can do anything but they forgot to tell the boys so the women are doing it the generation and the men and the institutions are still here so of course there's going to be a huge blow out and it's going to have very violent repercussions you know so he was like okay i mean if you feel that strongly do it so i wrote uh, i uh, asked kanika dhiran who was talking to me about something else that time i said will you write this with me and in a month we wrote the the story of it and i narrated it to karan and he was like okay he said it's really good he said i'm moved uh, so let's do this and within i think two weeks nirbhaya happened yes in the in the country so suddenly it was just everywhere and at that point we also said it looked too opportunistic if we do this right now because not that it was related but you know 
strokes so no, but we, in broad strokes it would yeah. have it would have been yeah. yeah so we we kept it aside for for some time and then then off and on we tried to you know revive it we took took it to various people blah 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 but for whatever reasons it didn't happen and eventually uh when and in in between i made an animation film you know so uh-huh. life goes on right yeah. um and then when me too happened yeah. uh and actually i was doing the, uh, curating those sessions for you at uh, mami i i just want to speak about it a little bit yeah, yeah the really when 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 me too actually exploded in india i wish it was a bigger explosion than um the way the movement came but at least the movement ensured uh, that people have become far more mindful uh, of many things that I, i i think all of us even the women weren't mindful of despite the fact that it's our story and it affects us you curated and hosted like a bunch of discussions at the mumbai film festival very very uh, you know important critical discussions so my question was exactly this that you know did that reignite you know this need to now urgently kind of make the story that you'd been living with for such a long time yeah so i mean because i and actually what all is there in the film now was there that time also in 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 it right so and then there was also in between a film called which everyone knows about called pink came out which yes. technically was on it wasn't about a rape but it was very similar if you want to pitch it it's a similar pitch right mm-hmm. um and a lot of people who knew about guilty were like oh this film as i know i'm really happy it's come out because my biggest problem with guilty was that it's not about no means no it is about misogyny <laughs> and it's about the other multiple layers that make up society so i'm very happy that mr bachan has told the country that no means no because now i can take it from there <laughs> so i don't have to establish this basic thing um so yeah so sorry so when uh, kiran was like uh, you know we should do something i was like i'll do it for you because i was like there was all this stuff bubbling inside me as like even if my film has didn't happen i wanted to come out and for me personally me too was a very liberating experience because for the first time like i you know as you know i've done a lot of work i've worked with a lot of people but i faced so much uh, you know discrimination which you know one learns how to live with ignore laugh off you know you know turn the other way you know all those kind all of all sorts of things or just say something yeah. like this is how it works yeah yeah i mean so, it's clearly not working for someone yeah so when me to happen it opened up all these conversations and even though i have so many amazing girlfriends who work in this business you know we never spoke about all these things because everyone was just trying to do what make films so nobody you don't want to like make excuses or complain or you know do things like that but me too suddenly opened up this conversation where all the women came out and started saying yeah i mean what about how people keep doing this or people keep doing that so it was very liberating for me uh so i mean i really i'm very grateful to the movement because it just opened something inside me and uh by the end of uh, you know uh, the mommy sessions i think on the last day or whatever i was myself so moved with with everything and i i called karan i mean i didn't even meet him i called him on the phone and i said karan i have to do this film now we have to do guilty so he said uh, he said yeah you're right we really we must do it so i said uh, but i am going to rewrite it because i want to include me too because he said you don't have to it works anyway i said no no i want to because i want to in a way pay homage to me too in my own way like it's such an important movement so i'm going to do a rewrite and on the phone itself he said uh, 
he said uh, okay so uh, you know we'll have to think about how it's made and suddenly he got this idea he said do you mind making it for netflix at which point i was like oh my god actually i would rather make it for netflix so he said how come i said no because then i can make it how it's supposed to be made because if you have to make it for theatrical there are so many other considerations but if i do it for netflix then i can be true to the narrative form so he was like okay then then let's do it and that is how guilty happened so you know like my all my stories i really like to highlight the end part which is the easy part this phone call happened but there is seven years of strife that goes on <laughs> behind it and before that so uh, i like to focus on the good part <laughs> focus on the good parts but uh, you know of course uh, uh, of course one also knows the kind of work the kind of rigor the kind of struggle uh, that you know one has to go through no matter how much work that they've done anvita being a case in point you know who's recently uh, done a film but anvita wrote that story despite all the accolades and despite all the work that she did it did take her 8 to 9 years to get a film made you know so i i i think that rigor and that a uh, passage of time is something uh, you know that that cannot be taken away or maybe it might change going forward but this brings us to the meat of the session which is that how do you you know you wrote guilty initially for the theaters and then when karan said that you know why don't you do it for netflix a portal opened up in your head and you said that wow this is an incredible opportunity because i can actually do more with this narrative and and make it the way i want to make it because i'll have that creative liberty if i do this for a streaming platform so if we were to divide the process into three broad heads ruchi and the incredible thing about talking to you is that there's no format left that you haven't done we'll have to imagine one um and if if we were to divide this up into writing directing and logistics you know just the process of putting something uh, out there could you elaborate for us the difference in approaching all three based on the exhibition format uh, and platform a uh, film for theaters versus film for streaming platforms film for theaters versus a series for a streaming platform and film for theaters versus a film for a ott platform what are the kind of so let's attack writing first so i think the most important thing uh, i would say to all of you um is it, it's very important to know what is your intent for any and i'm going to call it a project okay not a story i'm going to say anything that you are you wanting to create or work on what is your intent for doing it um and at every stage it's very important to see whether that is in sync with where your where it's going or where you're taking it why i say this is because as our session is a uh, call shape shifting which i really thanks smriti for i love that word um the reason it is called shape shifting is because uh what i found in in my life in my career and in my work the most important thing has been flu- the ability to be fluid and shape shift according to you know what what external uh things are happening and if you just are flexible it will be completely chaotic and directionless unless you are very clear about what your intent is so as long as you can keep your intent intact then it's great if you can shape shift uh in any direction um so having said that now i'll go on to you know elaborating uh, but but you 
and you know you never have to tell anyone your intent but you need to be truthful to yourself about it and your intent I, i'm going to speak a little while about intent because it's it's really key huh you can be a, a cinephile or you know a movie buff or you can uh, maybe you want to make a lot of money or maybe you want to be really famous or maybe you want to influence people or you know just just share your experiences all these are are good reasons and they are your reasons or my reasons but you have to be truthful to yourself what is actually driving you um because it will then you can make your choices accordingly so maybe if you if your aim with a particular film or a show is i wanted to do a great business so that i can establish my company then the choices you make will be different if your choices are i wanted to be a critical success then i want then your choices will be different if you if your intent is i want people to study this film one day or this show one day and say oh look it's it's like a a, a social uh, you know sociology lesson and something something whatever then it will influence your decisions differently so so you you have to be truthful to yourself about why you want to do something um and that will then be at the core of every decision that you take and that is what will make your decision right or wrong and then only you know whether your decision is right or wrong because everyone else will have an opinion um i'm also going to talk about this later but please know that in anything you do you will always have to face a minimum of 10 differing opinions and pieces of well meaning advice so how do you combat that is only by staying true to your intent um okay so now i will answer the question <laughs> uh okay. so um so i think the main difference according to me for ott and theatrical is the the biggest difference is the audience and the audience behavior um even even you and i would possibly have uh, behaved differently uh with a film which we make a plan with our friends spend one hour in traffic go and sit in the theater spend x amount of money buy popcorn eat it while we you know watching maybe we want to have a laugh maybe we want to be scared whatever and then go home so it's a 5 hour exercise minimum not to mention the thousands of rupees right when you go to the cinema as opposed to when you are alone and ott viewing is essentially done alone so is different when you are sitting on your phone alone and engaging directly with something um according to me it is the same difference of people when they how they behave in a group as opposed to who they really are when they look in the mirror um and i feel uh people also the the kind of content they watch on ott they don't all talk about it like people also talk about things which are being talked about like you know they might talk about oh did you see unorthodox it's so cool and let's tweet about it or whatever but at one point uh, like i don't know the figures right now 
but a year ago the most popular show on netflix was uh, does anyone have any idea what it was was it friends it was a show called jane the virgin so while everyone on netflix is talking about house of cards or breaking bad or all these things and tweeting about it nobody was tweeting about jane the virgin but they were watching it <laughs> yes sir what i'm watching tonight <laughs> jane the virgin yeah and jane the virgin it's not it's not like a, a sexual thing it's it's a yeah. fun kind of show it's a light show you don't like that so so what i'm trying to say is that Ne- uh, like uh, i'll talk a little bit more about netflix because netflix has an amazing algorithm which you know they've spoken like i know about it because my film is on netflix so they've spoken to me extensively about it so you know in their algorithm they don't separate men and women like they their algorithm is so evolved that they recognize that on on a one to one men and women don't watch things according to their gender so that's how insightful their uh, data is actually so it just shows that uh, how pe- what people talk about the way they behave publicly and therefore the way they make consume things in a theater is not not really how they would consume things personally on an ott platform which is almost like your secret conversation or your your innermost conversation so for for instance um when so also what ends up happening is that people who are consuming on an ott platform sometimes like netflix for example um it's also a function of uh, subscription right so how much you're paying so there's a and because there's more international content like till last year i mean this is all changing so rapidly uh but so so everything i'm saying is is like in a shape shifting <laughs> kind of scenario as well but um uh one one could assume that when you're watching something alone uh you apply you're more uh, inclined to apply your mind and be a little more open minded about something because you're not necessarily looking to eat popcorn and have a loud laugh so so that's why also when karan said you know would i mind doing it for netflix i was like no i want to do it for netflix because my biggest uh, intention with the film with guilty was that i wanted it to make everyone look inward like though the film is written in a in a way that it's a who done it or why done it whatever i wanted that at some point at least two points in the film the audience whoever's watching it needs to just check themselves and say oh i thought this or i judged her uh because of this you know so i really want and to me if that didn't happen the film was a failure as far as i was concerned and i also realized that in a theater one is less likely to have that experience than if you're watching it uh, one on one um so that's you know uh, like just to illustrate uh, that point um the other thing which i feel is different when you do something for an ott platform and when you do something for theatrical and this is not so much about film versus film it's more about series versus film uh, i'll just make a quick note to say that films made for ott are still a little new uh there are very very few which have actually worked or have been successful um and 
they you know you can attribute like roma was made for an ott platform but you know you can attribute other reasons for its success uh, a film which did really well on ott is a film like okja um so i again now this is my theory i feel that in ott versus theatrical theatrical is more about entertaining and entertaining doesn't only mean ha ha he he it also means uh, you know uh, having a good time whether you're scared whether you're having a romantic experience or whatever but it's more in the entertainment kind of zone whereas for ott what you really need is something interesting uh, and surprising so that's why like you know you you have many films on ott platforms which are like a romantic comedy they are very blah uh, but if you see like even just the poster of okja you're like what is this and if you're sitting alone it is highly likely that you'll click on it for 3 4 minutes because you can it's free and if you don't like it you can turn it off so in on ott platforms uh the the element of a little something different something surprising something unexpected is what i think works and this theme i'll i'll talk about later as well because it's very important uh, for ott um the other thing that i was getting to is in a feature film even if it's made for ott um the thing that is if if i have to say what is the most important thing about a film it is the story uh the story is what people remember and and if a film works it is the story and then all the peripherals come next but in on ot on series it's not at all the story because of the length of the format the story becomes ever changing so what is it that keeps you hooked it is primarily the characters so you really have to learn to develop rich layered complex and surprising characters and when i say surprising characters it doesn't mean they have to have white hair it means that they have to surprise you with their actions with their reactions their choices their relationships that that's what i mean um and the other thing in ott which again becomes more important uh than in a theatrical or in any feature film is that the world uh, also becomes a a major reason to watch something so uh, you know what you're setting it up in whether it's about politics in the white house whether it's the world of manufacturing crystal meth whether it's a fantasy world of game of thrones uh those things whether it's about money laundering or, or whatever you know those things become the most interesting thing and what hooks you so when you are creating when you are writing i think it's important to keep these things in mind characters are what is going to take you through because even you as viewers you you would have realized this that when you start watching a, a series you think the story is going somewhere and then suddenly you know you might even end with a cliffhanger but then the next episode starts and they just dismiss that plot point with a flick like it's just gone but you are anyways invested by then so you keep watching and then some other story 
thread takes over so it's according to me and why i love the format of series is it more like life um you are who you are you you also keep changing um various things happen to you so it's not like this is the story of my life lots of things happen you meet weird people you take wrong decisions they take you on a certain path then something happens then you go in the other direction and that i think is what the opportunity and excitement in doing a series and also in watching a series is um so yeah so that is uh, the the second point that i had one question that i had which was uh, which i had read you know because these days there's so much material that's coming out about you know technique and i remember that at one point of time we used to speak about tv like that because there was mad men and there were a lot of interesting series that were being done uh, at least in america uh, and and uh, you know people actually thought that very rich narratives were being told on television as opposed to uh, film Uh, so i basically wanted to also um, you know find out from you that when you actually start to write um for a series you're literally uh, telling a larger story with very rich characters and bite sides right and um you not only have to you you're not you know in theatrical you have to think about the interval point at least in india you know it's peculiar to india that you have to always think about ki interval kahan hoga but in series you have to create cliffhangers practically at the end of each hour or whatever the whatever the length of your episode is how do you how do you work that how do you you know so so now what what i was coming to my third point is the the way you write the exposition of your narrative in a theatrical film and in a series is very different um also like smriti mentioned in india it's anyways different because you have an interval so it's all the books you guys would have read on uh, screen writing would have three act five act now it's very hard to actually translate those things into hindi feature film writing because we have a two act structure first half and second half and whatever other books you may read honestly it is this <laughs> before interval after interval yeah, it is first half and second half that is the structure of a hindi film <laughs> so actually you shouldn't get confused with this three act structure and five act structure because it is it's it's just wrong to fit it into our our peculiar format um so so feature films and the other thing is the begin so the beginning the way things unfold your interval point then you know then the client then we have our pre climax and our climax so this is a indian uh, commercial film structure um again the beginning is is traditionally loose why because people come late into the theater so it's got nothing to do with the art form it is practical like you can't start and tell the most important thing because the person has been parking their car or they're stuck in traffic so they missed it so <laughs> your beginning is practical it has to be looser whereas in a show or series on ott it is the exact opposite and this applies even to feature films on ott like uh, you see in guilty as well or in any any series the beginning has to hook you enough to sample it because you might click on the tile but you usually decide within 4 minutes 2 to 4 minutes whether you want to sit for another 10 minutes so the beginning has to grab which is why if you think of anything you you've seen uh 
the beginning is always grabby the first shot or the second shot of breaking bad is you see pants flying in the air and the you know within within the second minute there's a van which has uh, crashed in this desert and a guy wearing this gas mask is come out in his underwear so of course you're going to watch it for another 5 minutes to know hua kya of course you're going to watch it right um so uh or you know the different different things are used uh in house of cards of course it's very attractive that kevin spacey is there but he comes out and again within the before 2 minutes are up he is doing something and suddenly he looks at you and starts talking to you so yes you are pulled in and you are going to stay there for at least 10 minutes so in doing this uh in doing this even even in guilty um like i had an opening where you know it it's framed like this like all of us are framed right but i did make it a little extra close and and i'll tell you now this again it's it, everything is crossing over but when i wrote uh, the script of guilty the film started with the interrogation of a boy called hamid so he was going to be a kashmiri guy and you know uh but when i was seeing the screen test and because i knew i was doing it for netflix this uh guy uh tenzin had audition and I, i mean i had told them that i i definitely want some uh, someone from the northeast also because it's set in du uh, but when i saw him i said this guy will open the film because again for a netflix audience and and he's a tremendous actor so i i really wanted to open with a very 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 strong actor and he's framed like this like this you know so it the the film opens like that so it's again grabby in that sense um so different things can grab you sometimes it's a casting sometimes it's a treatment sometimes it's what is happening in the scene um ma- many many things can grab you but you do need to think when you're working on an ott that people have thousands of films to choose from and they are all free so if you can't grab them in the first 2 to 4 minutes unless you know maybe they've heard something and the word of mouth has been strong they'll stay on those things of course are there but technically if you get down to the brass tacks of it for the initial audience you have to have a surprising grabby beginning it sounds mercenary but that is the requirement of this format Uh, the one thing i want to point out uh, and one thing that we need to consider and i think everyone's getting used to it is that it's not just people in india there's no geo blocking unless until yeah. there is something that streaming platforms are thinking of but at least if, when you're dealing with amazon and with netflix uh, and with uh, you know disney uh, hotstar the thing is that you uh, there might be word of mouth help, and and people might want to watch it but uh, it's very democratic when it's going to 190 countries yeah yeah so when you hear about a dark or a narcos or something of that sort the reputation will you know there are many series and all of us all of us consume content the thing is that there's so many series we even heard of that we don't watch but what ruchi is saying is that you will sample it for let's say instead of 3 minutes you will sample it for 10 minutes because you've heard of it but if your attention is not sort of held in those 10 minutes or the first uh, episode you're going to plug out yeah uh, which then takes me to the to the next 10 minutes so then when you do the so first you need to you do need to grab them uh, then in series writing you will see 
you will see roughly and this is easy to see after it's something is done that almost every almost every 10 minutes something unexpected happens uh the best example i can give you of this and unexpected surprising the example i'm going to take is game of thrones where it's outright shocking so every 10 minute 5 10 minutes you get a shock so in the first episode you start people are on the chase so you're like what is happening what is happening in the first 5 minutes you are confronted with an extremely violent image of a cut off head now in this day and age we don't bat an eyelid anymore because there have been seven seasons of game of thrones so now we are all immune to eyes popping out but when this show first came and i remember seeing it a friend of mine used to send it to me on pen drives ha huh? so there was no i mean i had never heard of it there was no word of mouth as such none of my friends had seen it but i remember the experience of watching this first season and suddenly you see this severed head you're just like what so you're like kind of frozen then in the next 5 minutes there's another beheading <laughs> so it doesn't stop there so again someone's head is cut off and they, he makes the little kid look at it so you're seeing all this then in the next 5 uh, minutes you see another uh, violent image of a dead animal with its guts spewed out ji thanks ruchi yeah i mean so i just then by the then so your your the violence is like relentless and you it stunned you it shocked you but again a person like me may not go to the cinema to watch a violent film but now in the privacy of my own home i am also like what and i'm glued and i'm watching it right so in the 30th minute you have your first uh, sexual image which is again something you're not uh, at now remember game of thrones is old right so you are not used to seeing this like nudity and uh, blatant realistic nudity not it's not uh, a body double for uh, demi more it yeah. is like a, a real a real woman who's not a model or whatever and you're seeing her like that in the flesh uh, so before you can react to her then there's an orgy <laughs> like then there are five uh, you know so then then the end of the episode of course even before that you have then they explore all the shocking things of sexual content so things which you don't normally see a brother and i and i purposely not had these images put because i personally find it offensive that it's always the woman who has to be stripped in front of the camera never the man so that's why i haven't put those images but um, you know then there's straight after this there's an image of and ruchi i love the fact that you know the explanation for that that is given is to attack our innermost vanity and they say oh women are so much more prettier the form is so much more attractive than a man and i was like please ask us because yeah. it's men that we sleep <laughs> with so you know so um carry on i just wanted to say that yeah so uh, then you have an image of a brother uh, touching the breast and the nipple of his sister so again you're like oh my god but because we are human beings we can't stop looking right then you have uh, you know uh, after that i mean then of course it go then you have uh, the anal sex images now we are so used to seeing you know other sex sexual content in regular feature films but you don't normally see this stuff so 
at ev- like every 5 10 minutes they are assaulting all your senses and the end of the episode is the brother and sister are in a proper sexual relationship that's the end of the episode so who is not going to watch this show and the thing is there's so much sex and violence that actually it it you know makes all your senses heightened so you watch it the telling of it the treatment of it the characters the story is all very interesting so eventually you watch the show anyway but they use these tropes and it's not just in the exposition of episode 1 it is throughout the season in episode 9 the person you thought the show was about is killed like i remember when i was watching it it just took me like a week to recover i was like what has happened and then they do it through seasons as well so the reason i'm taking it now game of thrones is a very uh, it's like almost a pioneer in terms of series ott series so now one is very used to seeing these things so the the same things will not surprise you anymore so you have to constantly find new things uh, there's also a hope somewhere that there will be a certain fatigue to this rhythm so then it will be surprising when they don't do it so all these things are to be kept in mind i was talking to a very dear friend of mine who's a writer uh, who was doing several shows for a platform and you know laughingly i said how is it going and she laughed and she said well you know at the end of it it all comes down to mathematics like at this 11th minute this should happen at this minute and i looked at her and i just thought i hope you don't believe that because if you do your shows are going to go down and actually that is what happened because however a uh, mercenary what i am saying to you sounds that oh start like this then in 10 minutes you have to remember the audience is also seeing these shows so then that will no longer be surprising so the minute you think it is mathem- mathematical it's going to change so you have to keep shape shifting you you have to keep you have to keep your senses open and it's really important as creators to to protect the viewer in you um how you manage to do that really i think is your your struggle it's it's always you know my struggle as well but um i i have found in fact over the years one of the reasons i've become very attracted to series is because as a writer uh in films i start i've started to recognize um the plot points so i know i've started to see if they've introduced a character in this scene around 12 to 15 minutes however random that character is that character will recur and be important in the climax so i've started to find <clears throat> personally the film writing format uh has started lending itself to a certain predictability because now we've been watching this 2 hour format for many many years so we've grown accustomed to a certain kind of uh uh predictability so ultimately as creators and and I'm not just saying this as a filmmaker even as a musician what we are constantly battling is predictability so you always have to keep yourself nimble and very very honest to yourself like what you tell others or share with others is is fine but don't ever lie to yourself otherwise you cannot you cannot create anything honest um 
Okay. On to things like you know things like feedback and deadlines and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also wanted to ask. I mean, I I completely agree with uh, you know all of this in broad strokes that you should know uh, you should know your formats. Even if you want to break format within a format, you should know what the format, what the basics of a format are, what the basics of an exhibition platform are. But then the thing is, the platform should be aiding the story, right? The story should not be aiding the platform. Like what happens if you think about the logarithms? If you think about all of this, doesn't I mean, isn't it important for you to know what you want to say? Because if so much flexibility comes in, will it not dilute your vision a little bit? Is there danger of that? No, so that is why I first and foremost spoke only about intent, because you have to know why you're doing something. If if you want to say, first you have to know what you want to say. But I, why I'm not being too judgmental about people. Not everybody in this business is driven by what they want to say. Some people are driven by other things uh, like fame or money or other, which I personally, it's up to you. Whatever rocks your boat, go for it. You know, it's your life. But that will influence all your decisions and it'll influence uh, what you make. It'll influence how you make it. And hopefully it will then influence the outcome of what you've made. And hopefully that will be in conjunction with what you wanted <laughs> in the first place. So of course it is a very important. According to me, that's why my stress is always on your intent and being true to yourself. Because I do think that if we share ourselves or our experiences, our thoughts, whatever, truthfully, it actually ends up building empathy, which is finally and ultimately what any good outcome of art should do. Um, so, so, and I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, the story, whether the story should dictate the platform or the other way around, I think that, um, there are certain things which are uh, more suited for certain platforms. Uh, but again, I would say, because I feel the intent of that story or that communication or that project to me is more important than the actual story. I think if, for example, you're not getting to make a film for theatrical, but your intent in telling that particular story is strong enough, you can shift, shift it and do it for another format. Personally, I don't think that's a problem as long as you're clear about your intent and that doesn't change. That is my view. So Ruchi, let's move to the last two things so that we can open the house out for questions because there are lots of questions, uh, which is feedback and deadlines. Okay, so why I wanted to talk about uh, this is that, uh, and there's one more thing actually, there's three very practical tips I want to give you about working for OTTs. Uh, one is, uh, for whatever reason, OTTs are very uh, partial to source material. So it's like I haven't done it myself, but I'm give, sharing this knowledge with you in case you want to do it. Uh, if you have a book, book rights, or some true event, or you know, these kind of things, OTTs are more, more amenable to taking those on than original ideas. You just have to fight harder for original ideas. Both the things I've done for OTT have been original ideas. So obviously they do it, but they are way more comfortable for whatever reason with source material. So that is a tip. Huh? Uh, 
uh, I mean, if you have a great idea and you can quickly write, they, even that they will take it, even if it's based on a very trashily written book. It's, it's, it'll be higher on their list than if it's just the original story. Um, the other tip I want to give you is whenever you work for an OTT, they will give you a bunch of deadlines. They are real. Unlike unlike theatrical films where deadlines keep moving, people move release dates also because the film has to be ready and correct. But in OTT platforms, because they're dealing with so much content uh, from around the world and they have this releasing, then they have that releasing, they are very serious about the deadlines. So those things aren't going to shift. So when you have a script deadline, it can go up or down by two, three days, but it's not going to go beyond that. So you need to take your deadlines extremely seriously. And the most important thing that I want to talk to you about is feedback. feedback. Now, as filmmakers, we, we get, you know, like everyone's an expert. The Panwala is an expert. Everyone's an expert on a film, right? Because you're making it for everyone. So they all have a right to an opinion. Um, in, unlike in theatrical films, uh, because you're dealing with uh, maybe a producer or a, or a star uh, who will tell you something. But in OTT platforms, you're dealing with organizations. So there are many people who are entitled to give you their opinion. And in some platforms, they are required to give you feedback. So it is set in stone that there will be four, three cuts or five cuts. So they are taking it for granted that you will not crack it on your second cut. So therefore, on your second cut also, they will give you feedback, whether it's required or not. So, uh, so it's systemic. And actually, because I've worked in advertising, I am very used to this idea of feedback. And the most important part I feel about feedback is how you listen to it and what you take away from it. And for this, you really have to drop your ego first and foremost. Um, like, uh, for example, and you know, the the keenness of wanting to make your film or your show the best possible to serve your intent is what should drive you. So people will give you, they'll send you pages, they'll send you pages of feedback on your script, they'll send you pages of feedback on your edit, you should read it. But just keep and, and pretend that it's true for a minute and think, is it true? Then look at that thing in from those eyes and see, see if you can see it from a different angle. So that is one thing. The other thing is if you, if, if, different people keep harping on a, the same point. They may articulate it differently, but you have to recognize that there may be a problem there. So you have to figure out how to address the problem. And then I bring it back to intent. Don't feel obliged ever to listen to other people's solutions of the problem. It's very important to be able to hear when everyone has a problem. But more often than not, they will all have different solutions. And more often than not, none of those solutions will be right for you. So now I was just saying that people, uh, you have to learn to listen to where there's a problem area, but don't feel obliged to listen to their solutions because mostly their solutions will be weird at best. Um, so 
again, you have to remember what your intent was and use that to find a solution. So uh, like, for example, uh, because uh, I mean, as a, as a writer, like even, for example, when I was doing my animation film, Hanuman, because I was creating characters for children and I was not a child, I thought I actually engaged an agency called Ormax and told them, you know, we've designed these four options for the characters. I want to ask the kids who I'm making it for, which one they like. So they actually did, and we did it for the two main characters. The kids gave such a resounding, decisive answer that uh, we went with it and it really worked. And those were not the two options I would have chosen as an adult. So, so I, I mean, it, it re you have to be open also to it. Uh, like, for example, when you're editing to show even your friends, people whose opinion you trust. Yeah, so you know, we got such interesting uh, uh, comments also. And you know, some of the things the kids said, uh, like we actually, the terminology they used, I even use those things in the dialogues. <laughs> you know, so they things they liked, things they didn't like. And it was actually amazing what all they pick up on and, and take away from it. So finally, what there was a very decisive uh, consensus on this one, on this one, because they, they liked everything about him, but they were also very particular that they want him to have a longer dhoti and some other, you know, bracelets. It, it was very cute. <laughs> <laughs> one has said nice body, the other one has said mota hai. Like it's the same, <laughs> same bunch of people who are giving feedback on this. Yeah, so see, they only didn't like the choti dhoti. <laughs> you know, they're even like, for example, I I'll tell you a little story about Hazaro Khwaisha also and the writing of it. Uh, we, because it was funded by the French government, we had a script doctor who came in and sat with us. And actually there were four parts to the film. So after emergency is lifted, there was a part of the film which was set in the future, which was 2000 in those days. <laughs> the millennium. Uh, very old now. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so she came in and she sat with me uh, for a week. And at the end of the week, the one thing she said was, you don't need this fourth part. The film should end when emergency is lifted. And we did that. And that actually ended up defining the film. So, uh, it's and and that lady Yvette, she gave she gave me feedback on a lot of other points in the script which we didn't listen to. Uh, but this is the one thing we took, and I feel it really made the film what it is. Um, so it's it's really important to understand how to take feedback and don't get hilloed by it. Uh, that is the most important. Know, know that, especially with OTT, they, the people giving you feedback, it's their job to do so. They are expected to give feedback. They have to do it. So it's only when there seems to be major consensus issues and several people have the same reaction of problems that you know there's a problem. And then you need to find a way to solve that problem. Uh, so that is the practical advice I have for all of you. I'm sure because of the way things are going, are all going to end up doing something or the other for an OTT platform. I want to start taking questions because we don't have much time. Can we unmute Pallavi Das, please? Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Ruchi. Hi, Smriti. Hi, everyone. Quick question on your... Um, uh, where you said that uh, 
there is a because i am in advertising and there is a lot of um, the whole feedback process from clients from stakeholders does make a difference to your product at the end the output of the work um, obviously with advertising the, the the construct is different but for a script or for a show for example how do you think feedback kind of varies uh for example i've also heard from a lot of friends who are into this who say that shows like jamtara for example uh those got directly made by a production house house who would have commissioned it and that got kind of bought over by uh uh prime so so that's a end to end uh, concept to execution that was aired directly so there's no kind of feedback or or like divergence from the state of prime type stakeholders or a panchayat for that matter is this a very rare occurrence or or do you think this is a better way of approaching or pitching a story or a film so that your intent is like comes out uh, to the core of what you would have uh, you know kind of wanted to portray your show as or make your show as uh i feel personally it definitely makes a difference and if you see uh, some of the best work uh for example the delhi crime yeah. uh delhi crime was a show which was made completely and then bought yes. there is a huge difference between the quality of delhi crime and some other content which was developed so i do think that, that which is why i spend some time on feedback because the the stronger the intent and vision is the better the show will be because most things in film making especially what is directorial uh is very difficult to explain to people and for them to grasp um like however many times i said this thing about guilty that for me what will work in guilty will work if the audience questions themselves however many times i said this nobody has understood it <laughs> so a lot of times uh, in in my process things were questioned where my answer would be because you are supposed to ask yourself you're supposed to think this you're supposed to think my god i should wearing that dress it is really important to my story that we react like this after everything <laughs> so because when you do react you will check yourself and think oh shit and so that's why kiara has that expression like forget it you know so it's so subtle and obviously it's something which cannot be written in a script it's directorial like i feel directorial things are very very difficult to explain and to get people on board and they only will understand when an audience sees it uh so of course if you are in a position to get something made without it being commissioned you should go for it <laughs> hi um so since cinema is such a collaborative uh, medium and you are talking specifically because we are women and when we sit in decision making spaces you know how we are very nice with the team so how do we maintain that intent and that focus while getting our work done also because along with collaborators sometimes we lose that and and especially with all, all the feedback you also want to stay there not lose the opportunity how, what do you do to maintain those things? i think you have to be a little bit big headed um and deep which are words i've always heard um but that doesn't mean you can't be nice when i first became a director on talash the advice sudhir mishra gave me was when you go on set just choose one bakra and uski sabke samne pant utar do <laughs> like just shout at him swear at him do anything so that everyone gets really scared and they don't come to you <laughs> with all their kitch kitch and like a good student i listened to him 
So as you must have noticed in this session, I'm a very nice person. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, when I was directing Talash, I was a maniac. Every day my throat was hoarse from shouting. I only used to swear three times in a sentence. And honestly, I think it was good. However strange the advice seemed, it was good advice. Because I was the youngest, I was the director, but I was the youngest person on the set. I think I was 26 or um, So there would have been too many people coming. And because I gave this really forbidding vibe at that time, only someone with a really strong sense of urgency would approach me uh, with, with a suggestion. Uh, fortunately, with time, as you do more work, you don't need to be like that anymore. And I am not like that on my sets. Uh, I haven't been for a very, very long time. In fact, during the shoot of Guilty, we've just had so much fun on 100 and advertising. We, we just have a blast. We're laughing all the time. We're talking shit on the mic. You know, so now it, it doesn't happen only because, uh, because I have a body of work. But having said that, it still happens uh, even now it still happens with certain people. So there will be one or two, and it is unfortunately only men, uh, one or two people on every project will give you a, a mysteriously hard time. Uh, it's you have to, yeah, it's, it's mysterious to me. <laughs> you just have to, I mean, I ignore it. Some people could confront it. But I just find it exhausting because my ultimate battle is always getting my content correct. So I find it too exhausting to have these small battles, though I have picked up the phone and said, you cannot talk to my editor without running it by me. So I mean, those things have also happened. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you, you just... Honestly, as women, we've spent most of our lives dealing with this. So it's, it's no different when you're on set and the stakes are higher. So that's it. You, you just have to negotiate it. And you just have to be, uh, you know, thick skinned, I, I suppose. Uh, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this insightful session. I wanted to ask that since there are so many platforms and since there's so much of diverse content that's coming up, there's almost a sort of, you, you know, we started with economy that how, how feasible would Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that would be. But then since there are so many platforms, there's only so many subscriptions that people are going to take. So the economy of this entire OTT platform seems to be dissolving in and there's so good, so much of good content that's out there that people are just not able to watch. So how do we deal with that? I mean, unless you're planning to start your own platform, I don't think you should worry about it. Um, you know, just create and it will find a place because, because there's so much content available at our fingertips, people's viewing habits have changed. If you see your own viewing habits, how much you binge watch, how much content you watch in a week, as opposed to earlier when you didn't have OTTs, you might have watched a film once a week if you're, you were a film buff or once a month if you were a regular person. But now you are watching things maybe every two days or three days. So I don't think you should worry worry about that uh so uh my my question is so how is your research process uh like when you design i mean not design when you write a woman character like well, how do you research about it of course you have an idea but then how do you how, what kind of research does it go that go, goes into the character about the research, I actually do a lot of, I'm very nerdy about research. Um, for example, when I was writing the story of Hanuman, which is an animation film for children, and it's like a fun kind of 
Disney Pixar type of film. I I only researched Hanuman mythology, different stories for like a month every day for like seven hours a day, and then I wrote the six-page story of the film in one afternoon. So that was the volume, like one month of research. And in an afternoon, I wrote the story. So that's how much research I do. On characters, I don't, uh, you know, because I, I think it's because I've had a very varied childhood. Like I've been to 12 Insti educational institutions I and in each place you go you're in a school so there's so many people and that, so I just I have met lots of kinds of people and uh, so I, I rarely research characters uh, because I have a lot of people I can pull from but I always pull from people I know so most characters in my work are based on someone roughly. Um, uh, Story-wise, like again, for Guilty, a lot of it was driven, like especially the end, everything I said, everything Nanki said, I didn't have to do one iota of research because that was all coming <laughs> from my own frustration. Um, but I, I did do a lot of research on cases and, uh, you know, the legality of it. So I did that, all that uh, kind of stuff. And even when I did a film like Kal, it's my own interest that I, it was based on a conspiracy. Like when I was younger and before Google and all this came out, I used to cut articles physically from the newspaper and maintain a conspiracy file, which my friends used to make so much fun of. But I would read an article, cut it out, and I would have a theory and I would write that theory. And then two weeks later, some other article would come. So I'd cut that and put it there. See, I knew this would happen. You know, so, so it's also your own interest um, uh, that drives things. So it's part for me, it's part research and it's part experience. Hi, Ruchi. Um, uh, this has been a great uh, learning experience for me and interacting with all of you. So my question here actually is related very specifically to the, 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 the theme of this uh, interaction. Primarily, you know, what I noticed is that a lot of OTT platforms in India. Now, if, I, if we speak about what happened in the US, traditional television became OTT there. In India, there is a specific thing that OTT is not going to happen. So what I've observed, and this is my question, is that since you have been a part of the creative process of several great uh, uh, material in film and now in digital, specifically with Guilty, uh, genres, you know, in the West, you see a respect for genres. So Game of Thrones was traditionally made for television, not for OTT. In India, for some reason, OTT is given that, you know, it's anything that you make, you have to make for OTT. But within that, you see a show like Patalu, right? So... You can't really typify it into a genre, but you can typify a house of cards. You can typify uh, Sacred Games season one specifically, or you can typify uh, Made in Heaven, which is actually a new genre. Very few new genre shows actually work in India is what I feel. And as a result of that, people are creating their own genres and there are a lot of shows which are becoming a beer. So get in a beer over here. So what is your point of view on that? That should you, like when you mentioned Delhi Crime, it is a very specific procedural drama. You know, it's a time and tested formula that has been that has worked in the US and in, in India has been made now. I mean, whatever, not in India, but uh, it's been made currently. So my question is related to: Would you respect a specific genre? Because you also mentioned source material. A lot of good shows in the West, like Game of Thrones. Uh, sorry, yeah, Game of Thrones has strong source material. You have uh, House of Cards, which was a BBC show. Hmm. So in India, very rarely you see people using source material. You know, and then for the quest of creativity, they want to create their own original shows. What is your point of view? What do you think will be the way ahead? I think the way ahead is because uh, uh, people, I mean, the initial bout of uh, shows that happened 
OTT shows that happened in India, and I know this personally because I was uh, doing that as well. When Anil Kapoor bought the rights of Twenty Four, after that, since that time, in the industry, everybody has been developing that type of serial content, which was television in the US. So I know that because I was also approached to do the killing. I was approached to do the Good Wife. Then I was developing something for Star, which was like that. I was doing a, a, a revenge story. So, so we've been doing that. We were doing that for like three, four years before OTTs came into India. So technically, we were doing that for television. Like Star had. I mean, I was doing it was commissioned. I was being paid. I had a writers' room, so I was doing that for Star, and they were going to put it on Star Plus or Life or Play or whatever one of their channels, right? And with it, but it didn't happen because it was the Indian television space is occupied only by soaps, unlike the West. Yeah. So what? ended up happening in fact at that point i i had in fact developed a, a whole show which i took because of my uh, relationship with star i took it to them and said guys who already have a platform called hot star why don't you make this content like original content and i pitched it to them and i was in talks with them for over a year and finally they said it's a great idea but we can't do it as a one off only when we decide to do shows can we do something like this so i had taken something to them at that time and then of course hot star has done it now hot star specials um in term so so i mean i hope that answers that part of your question so therefore the initial shows like even inside edge they were all ready written for television um and then amazon all these people came in so it was easy to sell those things and that happened to be original content but the next batch of things which is being commissioned they all prefer source material i was doing something uh, which was also i was commissioned for which was also source material driven if you go to any platform and you have the rights or source material that will get you there faster so the 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 next batch of things will be based on source material um only because the development becomes quicker um according to them i i don't agree but uh, whatever um in terms of the genre uh in terms of the genre i i feel it's always more interesting if you don't have a specific genre in fact because of this spate of the same type of shows that was happening on indian otts we used to sit and make fun that unless you're gouging out someone's eye or whatever then it's not a show which is also what led us to making a light masala type of show like 100 because we were like we need to see something different <laughs> you know it can't all be like this like you have to have some variety and actually that's exactly where the show has worked because it has been a relief for people to watch it you know and they are also been they've also been watching it with their family so it's it's like a film experience also for them in that sense so i do think that the more more off genre you go the better it is though it's always harder to position in the marketing uh, so that's where the payoff comes and recently i was on the jury for uh, you know judging some the ott shows of last year so the one thing i mean i can't tell you because it's not been announced but the one thing i will tell you is all the most interesting content uh, was done by uh, as pallavi was saying people who did it off the ott platform first and then put it on love mm -hmm. um you know krishna i would also say that uh, you know um um if you if you want a very elaborate 
uh, sort of take on genres, then, uh, you know, Dial M's uh, first session was with Vasan Bala. And he spoke very yeah. eloquently and in detail yeah. about genres and also why genres came uh, into being. Uh, and it was not the creators who created genres. It was actually the marketing, like Ruchi said, mm -hmm. uh, that, that made these distinctions. So, so have a look at that whenever you get the opportunity. Now I'm going to ask the last question. So uh, I'm also from advertising is why I'm asking this question. How, as a novice, do you protect your idea uh, or your script while at the same time showing it to others for feedback. I mean, because for a first time writer, I have to show it to people, right? I do not know what's working, what's not working, but I have seen how easy it is to steal ideas because I have an advertising. I see that. So how do you protect that? How do you? Yeah. Very, so, very important question. Yeah. It is a heartbreaking question uh, to which I'm going to give you a little heartbreaking answer. Um, I personally, it's, it's, I mean, we, we've all had experiences where our stuff has been stolen outright, you know, um, it happened to me. I fought like a wild cat and I, with the person who did it. And in the end I got my credit and everything, but it left me severely scarred. And I decided at that point, I'm never going to write for anyone else. If someone else is going to fuck up my work, I might as well do it myself. Um, so, you know, so it, it's, ha it's, it's happened to me even later in life uh, where I had a script and I shared it with some of my friends and whatever. And someone took that kind of idea and went somewhere else with it. So it's not just as a novice that you have to face this. You have to be vigilant. But because we are dependent on a collaborative, in a collaborative space, you have to end up putting yourself out there. As a writer, you can protect it by registering your script. Like even now when people send me scripts, mm -hmm. my first thing is please don't send me anything unless it's registered with the Screenwriters Association. Okay. So that you must do in any case. Okay. But I'm telling you practically after that, you still need to remain vigilant and then you have to fight. And sometimes when you fight, you strain your relationships as well. So you have to be ready to do that or not ready to do that. That is up to you and who you are or who you want to be. Correct. But it is a real danger mm -hmm. that that happens uh, and it, it never actually ends. Sad. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for joining us and Ruchi, thank you for giving us so much of time and sharing so generously your experiences. This is going to be so helpful, not only to the people who want to enter the industry, but to people who are on the cusp of it. And we've got a, we've got a fair amount of people from your community uh, who are working, uh, Ashima Chibur, yes. uh, Swatmika, yes. uh, the filmmakers, writers, uh, then we've got Avi Garewal all the way from, what is the time there, Avi? 9.30. Where, where? She, She's in Toronto. Oh, so wow. so, uh, so um, thank you so much for plugging in. And Ruchi, thank you so much for generously giving us time. Next Sunday, we've got a session with Vikrama Ditya Motwane. And he's actually talking about something really, really important. Uh, he's chosen uh, to speak about this because I think it's very important. Uh, and this was this was way before, you know, we were hit by a bunch of tragedies. Um, the battle inside, keeping a creator's mind and spirit strong. He really wants to speak about this and wants to speak about his own journey. Uh, so plug in uh, on 12th of July at 5 o'clock. And if you have any feedback for us, uh, please feel free to write to us. Also, let us know the kind of sessions you would like us to do. Uh, we are making this up as we go along and all we want to do is create value. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Smriti. I want to thank you and your wonderful team for having me. I think it's a lovely series that you guys are doing. And I want to tell all of you that 
it's such a great time that i have no doubt that each and every one of you are going to be working in this business uh you just just go for it there's so much work happening and you will be able to get somewhere quite soon um just you have to work at it but it's the best time ever for this industry so guys create opportunities for yourself i also want to say this which i keep saying this to everybody and ruchi and i were talking about it nobody owes you an opportunity you have to create your own opportunities you cannot expect ki isne mere liye ye nahi kiya usne nahi kiya you've got to go out there create it for yourself and it will happen and i hope it happens for everyone uh, so thank you